as another important conclusion to be taken home from this, we can give actually alternative definitions of a basis. We can say that a basis is either a maximally linearly independent set or a minimal generating set. What do I mean by minimal or maximal? The number of elements. So if you have a basis, you cannot violate, you, you cannot keep the linear independence intact by increasing the number of elements in that set. Why? Because a basis is not just linearly independent, it is also a generating set. So the moment you add one more element to a basis, it contains more elements than a generating set, which is the basis itself. And therefore, it cannot be linearly independent. So a basis is the maximally linearly independent set. Any linearly independent set in a vector space can have at most the number of elements equal to the dimension of the vector space. All right? So it's a maximally linearly independent set. By the same token, it's a minimal generating set. In other words, if you take away one element from the basis, and if it still continues to remain a generating set, then in the original basis, you had something superfluous. It, it could not have been linearly independent, right? If even with fewer elements than in a basis, you had managed to generate, then how could the basis have been linearly independent, right? So this same results, you see, we are beating the same dead horse over and over and generating all of these conclusions. So we can say alternately that a, if you just invoke one property, a basis is a maximally linearly independent set or a basis is a minimal generating set. It's like it's just got just about the right structure, just enough elements so that you can generate every element in the vector space. Yeah, And it's got nothing more so that you, no redundancy is there. right? And this leads us to another very interesting conclusion that so for hereafter, we shall mostly be dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces and I will use the shorthand FDVS for finite dimensional vector spaces. So for V, which is a finite dimensional vector space, any vector V has a unique representation with respect to a given basis. Of course, if you change the basis, then the representation changes. A pictorial representation of this could be, or the illustration of this point would be, again, our favorite, which we understand very well, let's say R2. So suppose you choose this as your V1 and this as V2. Obviously, this is the very standard basis you can think of, the x-axis and the y-axis. But on the other hand, I might choose this as W1 and this as W2. That is also a basis. Okay. Now suppose I want to represent this vector, say V, in terms of the first basis. What do I need to do? I need to project this on the first parallel to the second because it's all parallelogram law, you see. And I need to project this onto the second parallel to the first. So this gives me my alpha 1 and this gives me my alpha 2. So it is alpha 1 V1 plus alpha 2 V2. On the other hand, if I wanted to write it in terms of the other one, maybe that's that's the color. Again, I would extend this parallel to this. So this is my beta 1 and this one parallel to this. So this is my beta 2. So I will also write this as equal to beta 1 w1 plus beta 2 w2. So of course, if you choose different basis, 
then the representation varies. No questions asked. But what I am saying is suppose you fixed up the basis, then the representation must be unique. How do we go about proving this? We will of course not take the special case of R2 or R3 or Euclidean space. We will talk about the general vector space because that is what the result claims. So again we assume the contrary. Suppose V of course which is from the vector space V is equal to summation uh, alpha i V i where the basis contains the vectors V1, V2 till Vn. So it is an n dimensional vector space so, so to say right. So this is what it is. If, no, if it is not uniquely represented or if it has no unique representation then we can also write V as summation i going from 1 through n alpha hat i v i where alpha i is not equal to alpha hat i for some i. At least one of those alpha hats is different from the alphas. If not all, at least one of them is different, then we would have a different representation. But now if we write this implication v is equal to this and v is equal to this, if we put them both together, we have summation alpha i v i is equal to summation alpha i hat v i. Of course, both sum from 1 through n. Bringing them all on the same side, we have alpha i minus alpha i hat v i. The summation is equal to 0. And I am saying I am done. Why? It is a basis. The elements in VI are a basis and therefore a linearly independent set and no non-trivial combination can lead to 0. The only possibility is that these are all trivial which means that alpha i is equal to alpha i hat for all i which contradicts what I had assumed earlier. Yeah. So therefore the representation of a vector with respect to a given basis must be unique. Right? So this part is clear, I can erase this. Let us now delve into uh, subspaces a bit and understand this relationship with these vector spaces and subspaces and so on and so forth. Hmm? Okay. Sorry? No, no, this means alpha i must be equal to. If it has no unique representation, then we can also write v as this where alpha i are not equal to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, alpha i is not equal to some alpha i hat for some i at least. Yeah, thanks. Right. So now we are going to talk about subspaces because we already know what subspaces are and it is important that we study these structures of subspaces with, with respect to this new idea that we now have about basis and dimensions. Okay. So suppose V let us say a finite dimensional vector space yeah, has a subspace w right suppose v has a subspace sitting inside of it which is w okay consider uh, let's not call it b let's say s is equal to w1 w2 till wm b a uh, 
linearly independent set in W, right? If V set minus W, that means if this is not the empty set and let us say a little v belongs to this set, then S union v is linearly independent. Let us take a close look at that. What are we saying? We have a vector space. Within it is sitting a subspace W. There is a linearly independent set sitting inside the subspace. Now I choose to augment this set inside W with an additional vector. But where do I pick this additional vector from? I do not pick this additional vector from W. I pick this from that part of V which is non-overlapping with W, which is not there in W. Yeah. So this is linearly independent of course in V. And now if I look at the resultant set, which is the augmented set, then I am claiming that this is going to be linearly independent. Why? So consider beta v plus summation alpha i w i i going from 1 through m is equal to 0. If we are to show that this, of course this is the 0 of the vector space v. If we are to show, but the 0 of the vector space v is also the 0 of the vector space w, I hope you, that is clear, right? It is a subspace. The point is if we are to show that this is linearly independent, then somehow it must follow that beta is 0 and each of these alpha i's is equal to 0, otherwise this cannot be true, right? So what is it that leads us to that conclusion? Suppose beta is equal to 0, obviously the dreaded word, obviously alpha i is equal to 0 for all i, y. Because if beta i is 0, then what you are left with is basically elements from a linearly independent set by my own claim here. So the alpha i's must be 0. So the only case worth checking is, suppose beta is not equal to 0, which immediately means beta inverse exists. So hit it with beta inverse, there, right? Then what do we have? We have V is equal to minus summation beta inverse alpha i wi, which can be written as summation alpha hat i wi with alpha i hat being now defined by minus beta inverse alpha i, yeah? Is this clear? And again, I am saying we have a contradiction. Why? What does this mean? Means V belongs to, right? Because each of these terms comes from W. So that means V must also come from the subspace W, which is a contradiction. So therefore, we must go back 
regress back to the first possibility which is beta is equal to 0 and once beta is equal to 0 each of the alpha is must be 0. So therefore this is a sure shot way if you never run out of imagine so this is this is this is it basically to answer your question that you asked earlier how do you constructively cook up or try to cook up a basis okay maybe I'll just just hold 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 that hold that thought for a moment immediately from this I will go to the next important result which will now invoke the dimensions and we'll see an interesting consequence of this okay so this is clear I can erase this or maybe I'll erase the main result here let me see how much I can retain okay. if v set minus w is not empty this is not phi okay this is this empty set notation for the empty set then <coughs> dimension of v must be strictly greater than the dimension of w is this obvious why why should this be obvious just invoke the result we have seen right away. Consider, just go back to the basics. What is the definition of the dimension? Number of elements in a basis. So we have to start with the basis. Okay? Consider BW as a basis for W. Okay? Choose v belonging to v set minus w such a v is guaranteed to exist why after you have taken away everything that is there in w you will still be left with something to choose from in this set why because it is not empty by my assumption now Consider B W union V the cardinality thereof. What is this? This is greater than dimension of W. But what do we also know about this set? Further, we have just seen by our previous claim thus this p w union v is linearly independent in v right so if you have a linearly independent set inside v the number of elements therein what do we know about the maximal linear independence right the basis so number of elements can at most be equal to yeah it is it is so this what is this this number. So what do you say what can you say about the dimension of v then it must be greater than this number but what is this number this number is greater than the dimension of w. So this implies that dimension of v is greater than or equal to I do not know it might also equal might be just one more but this is greater than the cardinality of B W union V and this is strictly greater than the dimension of. So you never know which result comes in handy when sometimes you might be required to show that two sets are uh, two vector spaces are equal and somehow from somewhere you have plucked out this condition that one is contained in the other and in some other route in a circuitous route maybe you have somehow found that they have the same dimension then immediately turns out that you do not have to show that one is contained in the other and the f uh, second is contained in the first. If one is contained in the other and the dimensions are equal then they must be the same vector space that is what this result says right. So we will finally conclude with providing you a recipe for cooking up a basis starting with a linearly independent set.
for a finite dimensional vector space of course. We technically haven't properly defined Oh, I have, okay, I haven't defined, I haven't written, okay. So yeah, I have just said in words, so now that we have cleared the, cleared the air on the fact that the number of elements in any basis must be equal, we can just say that the dimension of a vector space V is equal to the number of elements in its in any of its basis. Some very interesting results you see you look at dimension of a space you look at n tuples but already by this you would know that this vector space C n over R is still an n tuple but it has a dimension 2 n right the field matters. Similarly there is also a very interesting uh, conclusion that R over Q. I will not give you a complete formal proof of this, it is beyond the scope of this course. Can you guess what is the dimension of this? Infinity? Why? How do you prove that? Of course, there is something that I am going to use which I am not going to prove, but suffices to say that there are numbers which are algebraic numbers, algebraic numbers in the sense that they are roots of polynomials whose coefficients are integers or you can say rational numbers. And then there are numbers which are neither, which share ni not, none of those properties. So they cannot be written as roots. And there do exist such numbers, they are called transcendental numbers. Do not go into transcendental meditation. Transcendental numbers. Two such very well known numbers are E, the exponent and pi. Okay. So at least we are guaranteed about the existence of transcendental numbers. So now consider a transcendental number. It is an irrational number, but it is a real number. So let us say, suppose alpha is a transcendental number. So to prove that pi or e are transcendental numbers itself will take up a lot of time and beyond the scope of this course. But we will assume that we are accepting of this fact that there is a transcendental number. Now suppose further, let B be a basis for R over Q and let cardinality of B be equal to some R which is finite. So we are assuming the opposite, the, co the contrary. Then what do we have? We must have, we must have what, what result then? What can we say? How do we specially choose this B? Let us say or let me let me just say that actually that probably would have been better if I had just proved the earlier result first but okay let us just take this. Let us just take 1 alpha alpha squared till alpha to the R. So if this was this, if all of this came from a finite dimensional vector space then for some finite R so let us erase this because I would have should have probably proved the other earlier result first but it is okay. So suppose if it is a finite dimensional vector space then the basis dictates that beyond a certain number which is the number of the elements in the generating set which is what the basis is also one right. So then beyond a certain number if a set has more numbers than the dimension of the vector space then it must be a linearly dependent set yeah. So if R is greater than the dimension of this vector space then such a set which is constructed by taking powers of this yeah, must also be linearly dependent. Therefore there exist C i such that summation C i alpha to the i, i going from 0 to r is equal to 0 but immediately we have a contradiction because this means where of course C i are rational numbers. 
So this would mean that alpha, which I assume to be a transcendental number, now ends up being a root of some such equation, some polynomial. So it cannot be, right? So therefore, if you assume that there is a finite, I mean at, at a finite time point it terminates, that there is a finite basis, that means there is a finite generating set, then beyond that point if you choose any set, you can always cook up a set like this to contain more elements in that generating set than that generating set and therefore it must be linearly dependent. But then that would contradict the very definition of a transcendental number, right? So just to quickly conclude this, now that we know what a dimension is, I'll just maybe mention this as sort of like an algorithm on how you can cook up starting with a linearly independent set. So consider S inside V to be a linearly independent set, all right? Now once you have this S which is a linearly independent set, this is the initialization of the algorithm, the first step. The next step is look at or rather construct the span of S, right? Construct the span of S. Of course, S is not a vector space, but span of S is definitely a vector space, right? Then look at V deletion the span. Okay, then ask the question, is V deletion span empty? If it's a yes, S is a basis and you cannot go further on this track, right? If not, if it's not, then what do you do? Choose V belonging to uh, V deletion S and define the new S as the older S union this V. So this is of course a little mixed up language, like, like code, coding language. So don't hold it against me. This is like sort of semi-mathematical and semi-coding kind of a language, okay? So once you do this, define this S. Then after this, where do, you, where do you go? Where do you go back? Again, you go back and construct the span of S. And if it's a finite dimensional vector space, it will guaranteed eventually spit out a basis. You, this algorithm will terminate at some point and will spit out a basis. And look at the things we have used down the line. Every step we have used results that we have proved today, right? We have shown you that if this is non-empty, you cook up a new fellow from here, it is bound to be linearly independent. If it's linearly independent, yeah, then it definitely is part of some basis. It can be extended to a basis. So what I'm saying is any linearly independent set can be extended to a basis. So your initial condition is important. Start with any linearly independent set in a vector space and repeatedly apply this algorithm. I'm not saying how easy or difficult this is going to be, but in general, this is a constructive way of obtaining a basis starting from a linearly independent set. And if it doesn't terminate, then you are dealing with an infinite dimensional vector space, right? Okay, thank you.